got to press the record button, which I'm doing now. Um, so yeah, for any questions, the Q&A would be better for us than the chat, but don't worry if you've pressed the wrong button. So we'll kick off with um, the first of Karen's short videos. It's um, five minutes long and I watched it earlier and it's really good. So here goes for that. And welcome to this Food for Thought tutorial. And um, one of the questions Lost video, lost sound. Excited for uh, for children, but one thing you, you need to bear in mind is that okay? When you're doing a raised bed is working on it. I mean, this is at a height for children to work at. If I was a six foot giant, you know, bending down to, to work on this would be a bit difficult for me. Um, so make it to a height that you're going to be comfortable and remember you need to be able to walk around it You know, you don't need to make it too big that you're not going to be able to get both sides This is an ideal size for the children because somebody can work on that side and somebody can work on this side These I'll show you these are um, Just what I got from a, an old plumber friend of mine that he was going to throw away and they're ideal for just keeping the net on. You could use canes, but I'd advise you, if you're going to use a cane, put a plant pot or an old drinks can on top, just to stop people poking their eyes out when they're bending down. But yeah, these are here. These were raised so that I could put something onto these to do it. But I'd advise that you put a net on, especially inside this polytunnel, because it does get very sunny and warm inside it. So it it keeps the heat in, but it stops the, the seedlings from uh, getting scorched. There's also a very friendly cat that comes in here who likes to fertilize the soil. So this net just keeps it off. And these keep the net from crushing the seedlings. So I'll move on to another raised bed, if I may, and talk to you a, a little bit about that. This. This is um, a, a higher bed. I mentioned earlier that um, the height of the bed is more, more important than anything else because you're looking at saving your back. This is for older children, but it's at a, a nice height that I can work at it. So that's one thing you've got to look at. This was positioned outside in this place here because of the proximity to where our water tank is. We've got a drain pipe down there with a water butt connected to it. So we've got a good supply of water for watering. The last thing you want to do is to have to walk a half a mile to keep your plants watered. Again, the net is important. I've got my, my reclaimed um, pipes from the plumber there. Salvage them from a, a landfill site really. But the net is important and you can use this net over and over again. A good net will last you for years. This is to keep pest diseases out of the um, out of the bed but again if you're going to be using steak please always cover them up with something because it is so easy to just poke your eye out with them and we, we like to keep safety first also stops the birds from going in there and eating your your, your produce so I'll just move on to a, another bed if I may show you again this is um, a raised bed that um, is at a more comfortable height, but the only problem is it's too wide. So in order to get to work on your bed, it means having to climb up onto it, which means you're going to be climbing over vegetables. So where I was saying, make it a comfortable size to work on. I can understand why this was made so big. It was so that they could get more produce in you know, to maximize the area. But you've got to think about working the bed. You know, this isn't ideal. Somebody from that side could work it, somebody from this side, but you still are going to have a, a larger area in the middle that you cannot work. So just bear that in mind. I'll just show you another bed here. This this is a raised bed. This is a very raised bed. We've got drainage holes in here for it just so that it doesn't 
filled with water and them seedlings are lying in water. But this was designed and made for a, an elderly gentleman who, who was wheelchair bound. So it, it's at a good height for him in his wheelchair and he can work all round the whole, the whole thing. But it's been raised up so that, like I say, he can work comfortable sitting in his wheelchair. We're going to put a, a partition in so that we'll have soil on one side and then the other side he can use for his seedlings. You know, we've, we've put this, this lid on so he can actually close it if need be. But um, thank you for watching and I'm ready to take any questions. Well, that was great, Karen. So, um, have we got any questions come up at all, Emma? Yeah, so we have a question here. Um, Karen, what would be the minimum height for a planter or a raised bed? Well, like, like I said on, on the video there, you could have them at any height, but, um, you know, probably a metre and a half so that you can get your root vegetables growing nicely, like your, your carrots and your parsnips. Okay, thank you. Um, and do they need to be lined? I didn't, was there any liner in those ones you were showing us or? Yeah, um, well, what, what I do is I tend to line them with some cardboard and then I, I don't like to use plastic. You can use the, um, what do you call it? Do you know the uh, the garden fabric to, that suppresses the weeds? But you know we're, we're trying to move away from single-use plastics if we can. So I, I do put cardboard in the bottom, and if need be, I'll use the um, that you know the garden plastic. Uh, I'm trying to think the terran matting that you use. I mean, if you wanted to spend some money, you could get some nice coconut um, fiber matting to put in there, just to stop the soil falling out or anything. But if you've got your, your raised bed on the floor, you know, on the ground anyway, there's, there's no real need to put a liner in. Unless, you know, just thinking about it, if you had trees or shrubs nearby and you, you was afraid of the roots coming up, then you would definitely put the landscaping fabric down just to, to stop any roots or, you know, perennial weeds coming up through it. That would be a time where I would put a liner in, but for the beds that the first couple of beds that we've seen, they were just lined with cardboard and then some manure putting in at the bottom, and then I, I just mixed the soil together to put in. But it's up to your own preference, really. I mean, whatever you want to spend on on it. If you wanted to to spend a lot of money on putting a liner in, you could do. But I've I found them just as well without. Is there anything that you shouldn't use as a liner? Um. Well, something that isn't permeable, you know, something that's not going to let water through because you, you want drainage. Um, you, you don't want the water laying in the pot, in the, in the beds. This could be detrimental to your plants. So, you know, anything that's not got holes in it. I'd, 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 I'd move away from anything that has been, you know, treated with um, weed killers and stuff like that. You know, you can get some... Uh, some pallets that have actually been treated with weed killer and we we try and avoid those it's it's to stop pests and diseases in transporting them but i'd, I'd move away from them if i could and again we're, we're trying to move away from single-use plastic so i'd advise people not to use them i um actually i just have another wee question karen you had mentioned about the net um for keeping off the cats Yes. Um, are, that's a question that I get asked quite a lot. Um, and since I've got a couple of Jack Russells here, I'm not that bothered with cats. Um, but I know lots of people are. Are there other, you know, people talk about um, filling a, a, a bottle with water or using CDs or something reflective. Is there anything else that you can think of that helps to keep the neighbors uh, cat away? Yes, um, many years ago, I, when I worked on the parks in Leicester, we went to Twycross Zoo and got some lion dung. And this kept the cats away from the garden. So, I mean, if, if you work or live near to a, a zoo and you could get hold of some lion muck, that tends to help 
keep the cats away. But um, they do say that normally if you have a cat yourself, that keeps cats away. But yeah, there is, um, there is little products that you can get, but they, these tend to be chemicals and I don't like to use them. But maybe just put a little fence around that's going to stop the cat. Yeah, okay. That the the lion manure might be a difficult one for most people here. Yeah. <laughs> to be it, was, it was a funny story having to go there and get <laughs> Absolutely. It's supposed to keep the rabbits away as well. The Romans used to use it to keep the rabbits at bay, apparently. Oh, okay. Um with the um if the raised bed was on the ground, are the rabbits able to get in at that time? Yeah, that's that's why you'd need netting. I mean, if you chicken wire, if you're living in a, an area where there is a lot of rabbits, you know, it might be best to put some chicken wire up as well as the netting. That'll also help to keep the birds out that's going to eat your cabbages and other other things. But yeah, rabbits can be a problem. All right, so a couple more questions um, come in here. Um, there's a question. And it says, you mentioned when asked about height, a metre and a half for carrots, etc. Um, yeah, your root vegetables that's going to go down deep. I mean, you could, um, you could also grow them in um, plastic, you know, old gutter in it that's going to be thrown out. Or you can get some old clay pots that were quite deep as well. But uh, yeah, uh, you it's your preference, whatever you're going to be planting there. Yeah. So that in relation to the depth of the soil, the metre and a half, is that yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I should have made that a bit clearer. Um, could, I, could I just add to that too, Karen? that um, maybe, you know the, the way uh, carrots can be attacked by carrot root fly? Yes. Um, and that if you keep, if you keep your plant or raised bed over a metre and a half or over three foot, in old money, they say, and um, the cat root fly is supposed not to be able to get up that high. Uh, another tip that I was once told is um, when you're thinning out your carrots, do it on a wet, damp day because then the um, carrot fly can't smell it. You know, they can smell your carrots for miles away, but it's not until you start disturbing them by thinning out or pruning or pulling, it's not that's when the carrot fly smells them and tends to come in but they have been told that if you do it on a damp wet day it's less chance of them smelling it so i've always done that to be honest it's just a little tip i was told i'd like to right. pass on great um I've got another question in here uh from rory what would you recommend is best to prevent slugs from accessing your beds uh, yeah we we had this last last time as well we you, you can put copper wire or copper tape around your polytunnel but i find a little bit of grease or even a lot of grit around it will stop them because they don't like going over the grit you could put um you know broken eggshells around beer traps but you know we don't tend to like them because they're not so humane but you could always try that. It's it's trial and error with everything. Coffee grounds, people have mentioned as well. And I take it you wouldn't be recommending using slug pellets? No, no. I mean, you can get the non-toxic ones, but it's it's still the birds are eating them. And you, you don't know the long term. I, I try and move away from anything like that, to be honest. I think also we, we had mentioned that at the last webinar, because slugs are obviously an issue for, for everybody all the time, that um, going out at night with a torch and picking them off is, um, is quite effective too. As long as you sort of remove them to somebody else's garden then, I think. Yeah, and, and checking on the stones and plant pots as well, because they do hide under there. I do find they like to congregate around a little bit of cat or dog food, so... Yeah, they eat them one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a couple more questions coming in here. Um, somebody wants to know, can you use sleepers, uh, either treated or untreated? 
Um, you, you can, I mean, years ago, people used to sort of pay you to get rid of the sleepers, but it's, it's companies or well, organizations like ours that um, started using them a lot and that made them less accessible to people. But you can do, it's just that I, I would probably then maybe line them just so that I'm just having a bit of tre technical difference here. My computer went off, that's it, sorry. Yeah, you can use sleepers, they, they are, they're thick and they're gonna last a long time because they're, they're treated with tar, but the only problem is on really hot, sunny days, that tar does tend to melt and then you're getting it into your soil as well as, as getting it onto your clothing. Maybe use some, um, if you are gonna use them, maybe cover them, just the inside especially, with some of the um, landscaping fabric. But yeah, there's nothing to stop you. And it's, it stops them being thrown into landfill sites as well. So yeah. they, are, they are good for raised beds. I've had that experience in my own garden. Um, we got sleepers a couple of years ago to uh, do a few levels in the garden. And for the first year or two on a hot sunny day. Yeah, you have yeah. to put some sand on them quickly, otherwise it, it, it just drips <laughs> everywhere, doesn't it? And that was quite a strong smell. So I suppose it depends what sleepers. And then a similar question, are old car tires, are they safe to plant in? I have, I've never used them myself, but I have seen them used regularly. And it's a good way of getting rid of the old tires. A lot of people on allotments especially will grow potatoes, you know, in banked up um, tires and marrows. So yeah, I've, I've never heard of any problems with using old tires. Again, in a hot sunny day, they will smell a little bit. Okay, that's, you know, it's a good way of recycling uh, a product that we can't get rid of really. I think maybe that's a good, um, this is a good time to share your, your next video, which, which shows you actually making um, smaller planters and stuff for, for windowsills. And stuff, Karen. So, um, so everybody, think of whatever questions, and and actually, it doesn't always have to be about the raised beds or the planters. Um, as we know from from the slug questions, so you know whatever it is you want to know about whatever came in your kit or or planting things out, please just let us know. So we'll move on to the next. Planting video. Hello again and welcome to this Food for Thought tutorial today on planters. So these are just some planters that we've made from reclaimed wood, some old pallets really, they've just been screwed together, um, some drainage holes, very important, put in the bottom. So it's just a case of using a drill, drilling out the, um, the holes there and then screwing them together. Always remember to wear your safety glasses. So like I said, they're just, they're just tacked together. Very cheap. Um, this is helmet. Just took the, past this uh, shelf life, this helmet. So rather than throw it into a, a recycling centre or into a, a landfill site, this has just been Holes drilled in for drainage, um, some string. So, what I'm going to do, I'll show you. I have some grit. You can use some small stones, or if you've got an old terracotta plant pot that's broken, break it up, pop it in the bottom, pop a bit of paper, line it with some paper just to stop the grit from falling through those holes, really. So, I've just lined the bottom of the, the tray. Okay, it just helps with the drainage, really. And then I'm going to add some compost. Thank 
got an awkward shaped pot. So I'm going to add some compost to it. Good peat free compost. Again, you get it from any reputable garden centres or your local authority make it. From your, from your green waste bins, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some trailing plants in it, some nice strawberry plants. Get them in. going to be hung up so what we don't want is the, the plant to be rocking and dislodging the roots so make sure it's nice and packed in. to go above you. shake, tap it down, get rid of those air pockets that we mentioned before and then give it a good firming down. Nice 
nice window box. Give it a clean, tidy a roll up. Make sure you give it a good watering. questions please let me know that's great Karen thank you very much um for that as informative as ever I um I had a couple of questions um for you grow growing on pipes you know drainage pipes spouting pipes is that um I can be quite a, a good thing to do as well can't it as long as you've got enough depth yeah, um, um, over in England, the, in the Yorkshire and um, Newcastle, they had big competition growing leeks in pipes, leeks and onions. So yeah, you, you know, there's quite a lot of carrots you can grow in them. It's a good way and, you know, like I say, they, they compete with each other against them. So it is a nice way and it, it uses up the old plastic pipes or the old land, you know, land drain pipes were old terracotta pipes that you find every now and again when you're digging. They, they were great for growing in. Very good. Also, um, I noticed you were putting in the, in the builder's hat strawberries, um, strawberry plants. And um, so now I'm coming into the dormant season is a really good time to put strawberries in, isn't it? You can get, you can buy plugs or, or runners um, yeah. quite cheaply, very rooted and, and start your, your strawberry patch. Yeah, as long as, I mean, you mentioned earlier about some frosts, you know, get yourself a nice fleece or some straw just to, to cover them with and just so that the frost doesn't damage the young plants. But yeah, get them planted now and harvest them in the, in the spring and summertime, really. Well, more summer than spring, but depends what, what variety you get. Sure. So have we, um, have we had more questions there, Emma? We've got a question here. Um, do you fertilize your herbs or fruit or vegetables? And if you do, what do you use? Um, I, I'm, I've got the advantage of having some, um, oh, I'm trying to get the, the name of it, the, um, the, the plant that I use mostly for making it. Uh, comfrey? Comfrey, that's the word, yeah. I make a lot of comfrey soup. Um, so I'll cut the leaves up and stems or whatever, put them in a bucket, fill it full of water and leave it for about three weeks and it's great. But um, if you haven't got comfrey, um, a guy once said to me that he felt that he was being bullied in his garden by nettles. So make nettles your friend. Nettles make a great fertilizer as well. It's just as good as the comfrey, really. You know, chop your nettles up, make sure you've got gloves on put them in a bucket, fill it up full of water. It'll smell to high heavens, but it's a great liquid feed. What you need to do then is you, you take the water, say after three weeks and mix it with say 10 parts of water to one part of your nettle or comfrey soup and use that. It's a great fertilizer, it's organic and it hasn't cost you anything. And um, that's pretty much what I use everywhere. And can you keep that soup for a while or yeah yeah as long as it's away from the house because it, it does smell it smells worse than that um uh lion dung that i mentioned earlier <laughs> so we'd maybe put the cats off <laughs> yeah um there's a question here from evie what other vegetable seeds um can we plant at this time of year uh, most most root vegetables, you know, parsnips, beetroot even. I, I've got some beetroot coming up now nicely, some winter cabbage. So uh, garlic, onions, you know, we mentioned those last week as well. So carrots, turnips, I think I mentioned turn parsnips, you know, all of those, your brassicas. Get them all in, get them covered with your net, and you should be should be fine with those. 
You could also do um, winter leaves this time of year. Mm. Can you, Karen, for... Um, but um, like we said last week, if, if you're growing indoors as well, like you've seen in the video there, the, the parsley and the thyme, grow them, grow them now, sow your seeds, put them in your kitchen window, help yourself to them whenever you're cooking. You know, if you're doing a spaghetti, chop them up, pop, you've got fresh herbs. And you know, they'll grow all year round, your, your lettuce in your kitchen or in your house. So just get sowing. If it doesn't work, you've got some more seeds, try again. It's all trial and error. I've seen something online about when you cut up your fresh herbs and you can put it in an ice cube tray and freeze them and then you've yeah. always got yeah. them. My wife always does that, yeah. So that works then? That's yes, okay. pop them on the top of your soup or your stew and they just melt off. You can just add a drop of oil as well in with it. When you're freezing them, add the oil? Yeah. That helps with the um the flavour. Right. Right, let's try that. Um, and then uh, we've got another question here. Um, are there types of herbs or vegetables or fruit that are good to plant together? Um, yeah, there's 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 lots of plant partners there out there. It's like um just off the top of my head, I can think of marigolds and cabbages. It's because the the marigold, the smell of the marigold, it puts the cabbage, you know, the, the flies off, the, the moth doesn't like the smell of the, the uh, marigolds and um, a lot of aphids, they don't like the smell. So it's best to plant some together. Or um, whenever I plant um, my tomatoes, I put basil in the plant pot with them as well. And this, this tends to help as well. And then would there be any ones that you wouldn't plant together for any reason? Um, I, that's a, I can't think of any. Um, beware of mint. I wouldn't, I'd be wary of planting that with a lot of plants because it just can take over. Uh, it's very um, evasive, really. But um, just, just thinking that that's the, the one I can think of at the moment off the top of my head. It's a, yeah, I'd have to you on that one to be honest. I might just jump in there Karen to say that um, I do find that um, the more variety you plant together the better it is because it does confuse the pests. You know she said about carrot root fly. I usually sow um, a row of carrots and then a row of scallions you know and then another row of carrots and maybe some radish and then maybe some more scallions and um, and then you're not concentrating one product, you know, in a small area because I sometimes I think that's like waving a flag at the the pest to say, you know, look, this is nirvana for you. Look how much stuff there is. So um, and along with the flowers as well. And I, I suppose all of us want to encourage insects into our gardens um, as much biodiversity as possible. So you get, you know, even wasps ha have a purpose. I know most people um, don't feel kindly about wasps, but they do predate on aphids and things. So, um, and also when you see things like ladybirds, you know, you need to encourage those and, and mind them and stuff because they're going to eat the bodies for you. Yeah, so it's a good point, you know, even just building a little bug hotel just to encourage the good, friendly um, bugs into your garden. It's a great idea. Uh, like um, a lot of people will have beehives, you know, just to get their bees in. I wish I had one myself, but I haven't. It's, it's trying to encourage them into your garden, really. Um, we, we started there putting sunflower seeds in the polytunnel just to encourage the, the bees to come in and to germinate the pumpkins and stuff like that. So you know having good partnership with each other is a is a good thing and like um jilly said there we we need to encourage more more moths and more butterflies and more bees into our gardens i think there's what there's one other wee question there about um what to put in your planters and raised beds i mean obviously if you've got a planter you can you can put your petri compost in that but um for raised beds, would you recommend a mixture of, you know, topsoil, topsoil, compost? 
Yeah, um, I was always told a good ratio was something like um, 40 percent topsoil, 40 percent um, home homemade compost, or if you have to buy it in compost, and then another 20 percent of drainage material. Really, you know, your your stones or your broken crockery at the bottom, anything that's going to help with drainage. Um, that's that's the the ratio I was always told. So if you can get a good ratio of say peat yeah. and um, or you know compost and and topsoil it's great i think i think that's a really good point about the the stones um because you know most people think if you've got a raised bed you have to to wreck to death and take every pebble and every stone out but actually that's kind of counterproductive isn't it like yeah. somebody once told me that um as long as the stone is bigger than a potato leave it there because stones help to heat up the soil quicker um, and it's a place for for insects and you know the the tiny creatures that live in the soil to go and, and keep warm and feel protected and stuff so so it's good not to be too fussy I think about um, having a few stones in your raised bed as you said it helps with drainage as well. Uh, you, you mentioned there about the, the stones keeping the heat in as well. Um, one of those polytunnels we, we built next to a wall because that, that wall gets all the sunlight and heat all day long. So it, at night time, it just it keeps that heat in, but then it, 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 lewd, it gets rid of the heat during night time, which helps to keep the beds warm as such. So that, that's a handy hint as well, you know, next to a wall there like that. That's great. Um, so we've, we've got quite a shy bunch today. Um, I don't, there don't seem to be any more questions just at the moment. Um, if anybody wanted to raise their hand or we could, um, is there anything else you're down to know? I, I could talk to Kieran all day actually about his hints and tips. <laughs> Things. <laughs> um, I know, I know, I'm, I know you've got all the tools, Karen, and the drills and, and, and everything, all the boys' toys, but um, I mean, a hammer and a nail is, is probably good enough to make, to make a plant or a raised bed with, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. And if you haven't got that, you know, you could, you could put some decorative string around them as well, you know, rope, anything that will keep them together. Sure. Actually, I saw, um, I was looking for photographs earlier of raised beds and I saw one that was it's just a mound of earth really that um was surrounded by plastic bottles. Um that I suppose it's just any kind of a, a structure that's gonna keep the soil in, in place. Yeah, old fallen logs, you know, old logs, trees tree tree branches, anything like that. And sure. like somebody mentioned tires, you know, you could build build a, a nice bed with tires, uh, glass bottles. It's going to keep the heat in as well. You know, you, you know there's endless supply of um, material out there. I think it's worth pointing out too that um, the whole, I mean, the advantages, I think, I think raised beds have loads of advantages. I think they, they warm up more quickly in the springtime. Um, I think, they're much more manageable space. So, you know, sometimes you go right down to the garden, you've got loads of growing area and it's maybe a bit weedy and it looks completely out of control. It's hard to know where to start. Whereas if you've got, you know, one raised bed that's maybe two meters long by one meters wide, that's doable. And I think if you, you start something like that and, you know, before you know it, you have it done, you have it finished and you feel really proud of yourself. So you can move on to the next one. Um, I think they help with drainage, especially if your garden can be a bit wet because you're, you're raising the level up probably about uh, 20 or 30 centimetres. So um, anyway, and it, every, there's loads of questions coming in now, aren't there, Emma? <laughs> so we've got one here from Alison. What is the best position for a raised bed in a garden if planning to grow vegetables? Well, ideally, you want it where, you know, in a part of the garden that, that you, you've got close to water, I mentioned there, but anywhere in the garden would be ideal. Um, 
you don't really want it under trees that's going to cause a lot of shade but then some people would put a raised bed where the trees are because it's the only part of the garden where the roots aren't going to be uh, troublesome you know you couldn't dig underneath a tree because of the roots but you could put a planter underneath the tree so you could position it anywhere like I said I, I positioned some of them next to the wall because of the heat coming into from the wall it, it doesn't really matter as long as you've got space for a raised bed you know put one there okay and then we've got a question from Evie um how often should I water plants uh, in a mini greenhouse and then how should I be protecting them from cold in winter? Well, um, if you've got a mini, I'm guessing it's a, a plastic one, you, you could put bubble wrap around on the inside. Um, you could use, still use straw inside your, your polytunnel or your, your greenhouse. That, um, uh, that's, that'd protect it from the cold really, but you know, keeping the door closed, obviously. Um, I forgot the beginning of the question. There was, that was two part, wasn't it? So if you could just ask it again. Yeah. The first part, um, how often should I water the plants in the greenhouse? Yeah, um, well, when required really. Like I, I said, I, I like to water from the bottom, so I would have them on a tray and then you'd see when the water's gone, but just testing the soil to see if it's moist or if it's dry. You know, that, that's a good indication. You'd also see if the, um, the plants are in distress, but overwatering would, would also put them in distress. So just test it regularly just to see if it needs, you know, adding water to. And are there, you know, is it, is it better to be a little bit dry and water less? Is that less harmful than overwatering or? But probably yes. Yeah, overwatering would be more, more detrimental, especially in the winter months. Okay. Um, and then we have a question from Rory here. Are there any veg you would plant from seed in raised beds now without a net covering? In raised beds? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the carrot fly isn't so much about this time of year, so your carrots would be in, your onions, you could get away with them, your leeks. The, again your cabbages but the, the trouble is birds you know they, they feed just in the winter as well as in the summer so you know you've got to be careful of those but you could put any any of them in just be careful that some you know something's going to happen to them can um can i jump in there too karen um because i um I don't i you know i'm kind of a lazy gardener myself so i i don't often cover things with nets so you know at the minute I have you know the seeds of the the spinach and the radish and the all the seeds apart from the basil that you know that came in the family grown pack I I have them all sown out in a raised bed now I am an encounter a man we've had three or four frosts this last 10 days but everything's perfect in there and um, obviously I had I have the basil inside because it's not that hardy um but I get with the bird thing, we have a lot of pigeons around here too, but um, I usually leave it to see if there's a problem. It's kind of like the slugs, you know, um, just have a wee walk past every day, have a wee look, see if they're getting nibbled or pulled out or whatever, um, you know, and then you can maybe take action with it. But, um, you know, sometimes if you don't have a net, um, sometimes what I would do would put be put bamboo canes or sticks around um, and you know and maybe get a ball of string and sort of go backwards and forwards so that would put the pigeons off because I think pigeons seem to be the worst thing around here anyway so you know if you don't have a net don't worry there's you know have a go anyway and and there are other things that you could try yeah you mentioned silver foil as well that's you know that's a deterrent and old cd anything that glistens, even putting up plastic bottles on string, you know, just the movement puts them off. I think that's right. Or, I mean, I can remember trying in the past, um, you know, like one of those beach children's whirly things, like the, I can't remember what you call it, but um, 
yes, if there's a bit of movement and a bit of colour, I did the birds that kind of scares them a wee bit. Well, that seems to be it. The time really does fly. It's like it's 10 to 8 now. So um, I just want to say thank you very much to Emma for helping with the questions and also to Karen for, for doing the videos and for answering everything so splendidly. Also, thank you very much to everybody who attended this evening. And we're going to put the videos up um, and send you a link that they'll be in the Live Here, Love Here YouTube channel as well. So next webinar is coming up really quickly. It's, going, it's on Tuesday the 6th and it's our first one on foraging with Claire McQuillan and Erin Bunting. So they're, um, they'll have been foraging blackberries and are going to make something or a few delicious things with those. And then the next TCV one is next Thursday the 8th at 7 p.m. So I'll be sending out links to those um, for you all. And if you can keep checking your junk, because I think sometimes MailChimp emails might go into there. So thanks a million for joining. Um, and we'll see you the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.